Good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are, to our the, uh, Baltimore Rotterdam Designing Cities web webinar series. I'm Christina Murphy, and I'm an assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University, and also an adjunct professor at WAC Virginia Tech. Today, Colin Jordan will moderate the talk of Evan and we, why will um, in Felix Mandrazo presentation. Last week, we had a very exciting panel that discussed on uh, design culture, design as a service, designer as part of the in-between the space and the, and the client. The design as a part of a wider field of expertise in order to deliver right, reach, uh, rightful spaces. Last week, the designer became the interpreter, the servant, the facilitator of communities. That means that in order to, um, to, to uh, design something nice and something useful, we need to think about the others and realize others' people ideas and place them before our ideas as designers. We need to look at design as a cooperation of agents enabling the project to reach a higher level of accomplishment. If we want to create designs, designs and spaces that work for the function they are meant to hold, we need to engage outside our comfort zones. Can, can we as designers commit to that? Can we give a voice to the folks we are designing for? From February till April, we are, pre we are presenting nine lectures featuring dynamics discussions among two cities, Rotterdam and Baltimore. Specifically, we will hear how design and policy can improve the built environment and provide access to all. Each week, two designers will discuss design topics from social, spatial, architectural point of views specific to Rotterdam and Baltimore. Through conversation, we will explore if and how the environment is determinant to the failure or success of projects that um, are, minimal, are minim, meaningful to the city, to the citizens, and to the well-being of the citizens. All welcome to this series, to this webinar this evening, this afternoon. Please ask questions, and you can do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We will try to answer all your questions. This afternoon and evening, moderator is Jordan Coleman. He is an assistant professor at Morgan State University School of Architecture and Planning graduate architecture program and principal of Studio Kaje, an interdisciplinary research design practice. Coleman is co-founder of a non-for-profit organization in Canada called Corners. His projects focus on social justice and development in underrepresented communities in both domestic and international context. Most recently, Coleman has curated the exhibition, We the Seven, a conversation with the African diaspora at the Venice Biennale, Architectural Biennale in Venice, Italy. Coleman, welcome. Please turn on your video and your audio and take the lead. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. Um, if so, we'll get started. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you, uh, Christina, for your uh, for the invite to participate in this conference, and then also thank you for uh, your introduction of myself. Um, so again, I am Coleman Jordan, Coleman in my first name, and I am an assistant professor at Morgan State University. Um, and today um, I'm going to introduce our guest speakers for this conference and moderate any uh, questions uh, afterwards, and also of the audience uh, participate as, as we see fit. So on the top, this uh, speakers will be speaking on the topic of designing in cities. And so our speakers today are Evan Weibel and Felix Medrazo. Uh, Evan Weibel is, I'll introduce first, and Evan is a principal architect and founder of East Wing Architects based uh, here in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he was raised on a dairy farm in rural Maryland at an early age and built the barns and small structures with his father. In uh, 2016, uh, he formed the firm East Wing as a design build studio. And uh, this practice is a natural continuation of his early experiences and pragmatism, hands-on creativity and self-reliance. Uh, East Wing Architects projects touch on a, a range of scales 
and styles, uh, primarily focusing on uh, creating meaningful spaces and places that reflect an intimate and empathetic relationship between the creator and the uh, consumer, especially within the uh, Baltimore urban landscape. Uh, Evan is a frequent uh, jurist here at Morgan State University's School of Architecture and Urban Planning. And he also sits on reviews at Catholic University's uh, School of Architecture, which is down the road, and uh, I believe it's in the DC area, uh, where he received his uh, master's degree of architecture. And uh, lastly, uh, which Evan may not know that I did this, but I was uh, as I was reviewing uh, Evan's practice online, his name popped up as an accomplished musician. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, Evan, when you get on here, but um, from my understanding, you are an accomplished musician that either do or has played uh, with a band called Mindset, and I think a couple of other uh, bands. So for me, this is a really interesting topic because we're in this um, creative culture and creative mindset that um, hopefully we can have a conversation on, on another topic to discuss or hear at a later date, uh, but I found that to be very interesting. Uh, okay, so after uh, Evan, we will have uh, our speaker, uh, Felix Madrazo. And Felix is an Felix is an architect, uh, urbanist, researcher, and lecturer, originally from uh, Saltillo, Mexico. And I may be pronouncing some of these uh, names wrong, so please excuse me. Uh, he studied architecture in La Salle in Mexico City and has an architecture master's degree from the Verlage Institute. He is a uh, founding partner of, of an architecture firm called Studio IND which stands for International Design, located in Rotterdam, the uh, Netherlands. He's the, also the uh, co-founder of the research collective Super Sudaka. And uh, Felix is also a lecturer in various universities, including TU Delft's The Y Factory. He is a co-author of the books City Shocks and Copy Paste, Done, in conjunction with the Y Factory. Uh, now, Felix, uh, Felix, you can uh, maybe give us some more insight on the concept of the Y Factory and its ties to uh, TU Delft uh, for maybe clarity, potentially after your talk. Uh, so, Felix, the only thing in my <laughs> in relationship to looking up uh, Evans' uh, sort of surprise, I don't know if you have any musical or hidden talents that you may want to share with us, uh, or I may have missed. But feel free to enlighten us as you go uh, to your lecture and speak to us about the uh, the topic of the day. So, uh, with that in mind, I thank all of the audience for participating today and attending. And uh, we hope that you will actually send in questions along the way, um, as Christina uh, has mentioned. But without further ado, I will give the Zoom platform to Evan. And thank you for your patience. So, Evan, you've got it. Yep. Thank you uh, for that <laughs> introduction, Coleman. Uh, I hadn't prepared any slides about uh, music, but we might be able to touch on that later. Um, okay. And thank you to Christina for uh, for the invitation and for having me. Cool. Uh, as as Coleman mentioned, my name is Evan Weibel. I'm an architect uh, here in Baltimore City. Uh, my firm, Eastwing Architects, is a, a team of six uh, incredibly talented uh, designers and architects, many of which are on this, uh, are, are watching right now. So uh, hello to them. Uh, we work on a variety of scales and typologies, primarily focusing on, uh, as Coleman said in my bio, creating meaningful, meaningful spaces and places that reflect an intimate and empathetic relationship between creator and consumer, uh, specifically within uh, the vibrant Baltimore urban landscape. We, um, we don't necessarily specialize in a, in a typology, um, but rather uh, seek um, bold, passionate, and adventurous clients who care deeply about the quality of the spaces they inhabit and understand their role in the greater context of the community. Um, and it's also, it's incredibly important to us um, and why I believe this talk is valuable. It's important to me to be sort of a Baltimore architect. That's, that's sort of a, a core element of, uh, of my career. Um, a little bit about me, uh, I was born and raised on a family dairy farm in rural Maryland, um, part of a fifth generation of my family to work the land. I was a, uh, obviously being the son of a farmer instilled a deep appreciation for the natural environment, 
a respect for labor uh, and a pragmatism that I carry with me in my work. I uh, spent my childhood feeding chickens and milking cows and building and repairing uh, the sort of barns and sheds on the property. On the right is uh, myself and my father. You can see some of those structures behind us. Um, and on the left is my first uh, design built project, uh, lean to uh, with a surprisingly well calculated Southern uh, orientation uh, that we made with sort of scrap materials for some of the livestock. I was probably about 14 at the time. Um, it was projects like that that really, really kicked off my, uh, my love for design and construction and creating um, spaces and structures. Um, as a child uh, growing up in a rural area, fairly isolated from urban life, I was always fascinated by the city, um, specifically Baltimore. It's always been very exciting to me. Um, it's always felt like home. I spent a lot of time in my, in my early um, years when I was in college, um, you know, as, as Coleman mentioned, playing, playing music in Baltimore City, which was always sort of frightening and exciting and, and just full of adventure. Um, and that's, that's really what kicked off my love of the city and the people within it. Um, I believe that Baltimore attracts and cultivates an adventurous spirit, um, which um, has led me to, to be involved in some very interesting projects and meet some very interesting people. Uh, I believe that Baltimore also has what you might call a low barrier to entry. Um, it's you know, sort of easy, easier um, than most cities maybe to acquire space, um, acquire land and um, get things done. Um, I believe that I you know, may not have been able to start uh, my firm at the time I did if I were in, a, in another city. Um, as an architect, I have the great privilege of seeing the city from a different perspective than many people do, um, which I, you know, could be considered from within the voids um, of the pure space. I feel most people experience the city sort of from the streetscape. We have some insider um, behind the scenes access, which is one of my favorite, favorite parts of my job is exploring these uh, forgotten spaces and being able to imagine um, the potential that they have. These are um, some shots from, um, you know, existing condition surveys of, you know, my firm exploring abandoned row homes. Um, Baltimore, as you know, many people are aware, and like most cities, is a is a city of disparity and contrast. These are um, again as built survey uh, photos from two different parks in Baltimore park neighborhoods, Harlem Park and Roland Park. These could both be considered fixer uppers um, in those um, in their respective neighborhoods. Roland Park being a um, a wealthier neighborhood um, with you know sort of beautiful, um, well maintained. Um, larger homes, and then Harlem Park is a, a neighborhood that is, that's sort of seen better times and is um, has a you know lower economic opportunity. And many of the homes have sort of almost been overtaken by nature over time, just with the the lack of development. Um, I believe that uh, limited resources um, lead to unlimited potential. Um, where we are in our, with our firm and the work we do. Uh, many of our clients are, are younger, sort of upstarts, um, startup companies, first-time homeowners, people with limited resources, and then Baltimore itself, just with, um, with the sort of economic situation, just has a sort of lower ceiling um, on a lot of things like property value and just sort of the, the practical economic factors um, of architecture. Um, the economic environment of Baltimore is an unavo unavoidable driver behind the work we do. Um, as I mentioned, our typical client is a startup entrepreneur, first-time homeowner, homeowner, often bootstrapping their vision on a tight budget and often in a hurry to reduce carrying costs. COVID-19 has exacerbated this condition with rising material and labor costs, uh, increasing construction costs and lead times and complicating many um, pre-established business models. We believe at East Wing in doing more with less. Every project exists in its own ecosystem of finite resources, financial, spatial, chronological, we strive to maximize the impact of our work through creative manipulation of these resources. We believe that these limitations, restrictions, and regulations encourage creativity. Um, interesting enough, this firm has really grown significantly during the pandemic, and much of our work um, is currently under construction. Um, the, there was sort of a building boom uh, locally um, that we were um, fortunate to sort of ride that wave um, in, in many ways, very privileged. Um, a few samples of our of our ongoing projects right now. This is a private residence um, addition renovation of a wood framed uh, duplex in the Hamden neighborhood of Baltimore. The angular um, contemporary addition pulls some of the proportions and massing from the existing house, but 
is actually parallel to a wedge-shaped um, side lot. Um, again, this is in construction, but an example of our current projects. Um, Tribal Interiors showroom is a warehouse renovation project for a company, um, this really great couple that, uh, an anthropologist and his wife that import um, African art and artifacts um, and furniture and, um, and sell it locally. So this is a sort of an, you know, long abandoned warehouse space that we are uh, retrofitting to be their offices, warehouse and showroom. Um, one of the design features we've implemented um, which is sort of a cost-effective creative solution, I believe, is to um, CNC plywood panels with um, African motifs, uh, creating uh, delineation between spaces and also wayfinding. Uh, no and Beyond is uh, Baltimore's first board game bar. Um, we often find ourselves with our clients as um, sort of business consultants as well. Um, a lot of clients just don't um, don't sort of understand how space can actually affect their, um, their business model. Um, we help them understand how well-crafted space can affect the customer experience and streamline their service model to uh, contribute to their success. This is a great example of how our work uh, can enable a small business to grow and thrive. This is actually in a um, sort of what would maybe called an up and coming neighborhood. Um, so they're trailblazers in a sense. Um, we work closely with the owners who are now great friends of ours to join a series of disconnected spaces around a central bar. These images show two custom light fixtures uh, we designed with off the shelf parts that you could you know, buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or any uh, building supply store. Uh, so doing more with less. Uh, sophomore Coffee is a, um, one of my favorite projects. It was a sort of dank, dark basement um, that was, um, we uh, renovated with the help of one of the owners who's a very talented interior designer to bring um, just light and um, light and lightness into the space, polished concrete floors, corrugated metal on the ceiling just sort of floods the space with light from you know, fairly small uh, window openings. It's now um, sort of a you know, well-known um, place for a morning coffee and otherwise a, a place that um, would not be very pleasant to spend your morning. Um, this is 3531 Claremont Avenue in um, the Highland Town neighborhood. This is a great, great example of um, the clients that we love to work with. It's a young family, young growing family who had a deep appreciation, not only for the neighborhood, but for this building itself, which was an old um, corner store with a um, sort of small warehouse attached to the back. Um, the family, uh, the family that were my clients communicated directly with the, um, the previous owners and their family and many of the neighbors um, to sort of, you know, partly as a gesture of goodwill, but to get buy in and, and understand, um, you know, more about the community and not, not sort of come in as outsiders. Um, this project is inspired by the uh, industrial sawtooth roof forms um, that I'm sort of enthralled with in, in many parts of Baltimore, which is a way of bringing, um, bringing light into the interior of the spaces. Um, we also play with the rhythm of the adjacent row house forms. Um, this is actually a, a, a duplex, sort of a quasi duplex um, that we sort of broken down that, that rear massing um, with those row house proportions. Um, this is a multi-generational project with a, the young family and their parents um, connected via a stair tower, which is a sort of vertical wood clad structure, um, which leads to a roof deck. Um, there's some, some other just small examples, snapshots of some of our commercial work in Baltimore City. A lot of what we're trying to do is really activate the streetscape, often um, streetscapes that are um, neglected or forgotten, and then um, just finding ways to um, do uh, interesting things uh, for small businesses within the city. Um, this is a, a rendering from a project that's in construction now, which is uh, Dallas Street. Uh, I wanted to share a little bit more about this project. I feel like this really tells the story of the growth of East Wing Architects um, and what I believe is a sort of classic story of a young architect getting their footing um, in their city and um, admittedly sort of learning, <laughs> learning by doing, learning as they go. Um, I was originally referred to this client by another architect um, to do a small ground floor renovation, their uh, floor was actually sinking into a, an old, you know, century old crawl space. Uh, from there, the project continued to evolve. Um, some might say spiral out of control. 
uh, into what will become a, uh, one of our most complex renovation projects to date. Typic, uh, it's an atypically wide row home. It's about 18 feet wide um, as compared to the sort of 12 to 14 foot range of many of our other row house projects. Um, I believe it was originally maybe a uh, boarding house for uh, stevedores. It's in the uh, Fells Point neighborhood. Um, it occupies a small um, alley, uh, one-way alley, uh, which is itself a tapestry of uh, Baltimore building types, small alley row homes, 11 feet wide, larger industrial buildings. Um, it's also adjacent to the Douglas homes, which were built by Frederick Douglas as rental homes for African-Americans in the late 19th century. So even just on this block, there's a really great examples of the richness that you'll find in, in many Baltimore neighborhoods. Um, these clients, um, Scott and Jen, have become great friends of mine, really ideal clients. This is the kind of people that we, we love to work with. They're energetic, passionate about their city uh, and their community and heavily involved in the, uh, in the local community. Um, they were determined to stay in the city and uh, grow and build a family. And we helped them create a home that would allow them to do so and would evolve with them. Um, this project has also sort of rode the wave of the pandemic as well, um, where there's a lot of sort of improvis improvisation um, because of surging material costs, delays, et cetera. Um, this project is in a, a historic district um, within Baltimore City. Uh, here are two, uh, on the left is a, is a Quonset hut version, which is actually rejected uh, by CHAP. On the right was an approved model um, that was then adjusted um, because of a um, unexpected issue with a power line. So wanted to sort of show the evolution of it. Um, we ended up with this sort of clear story form where the clear story actually avoids that power line and um, also um, creates a really beautiful opportunity to flood that space with light. This is sort of the, the location. You can see the Douglas Place row homes, but also just the variety of scales that exist on this small block. Um, it's a very interesting, interesting and rich context. Um, this is some of the original uh, interior renovations, interior uh, renderings of the uh, arched um, barrel vaulted uh, Quonset hut roof. The third floor is um, actually the living space with uh, these really great views downtown and also a roof terrace over the existing two-story structure. Uh, just some, some progress photos. You can see on the right sort of classic Baltimore formstone, um, the sort of small, almost cube-like squat building. Um, but from the interior, this sort of the surprise world of a really a hidden garden in the rear, um, which you can, you can see um, in later images how we've opened up the structure um, to really experience that sort of inward looking um, situation. Just some additional construction photos. We're hoping to wrap this up um, in April, um, which we're, we're really excited about. You can see on the left, the, the stripping away of the form stone, which is coming more, more and more rare in Baltimore City. And then that clear story space that just floods that upper uh, third floor living area with light. Uh, this, this is my last slide. As a Baltimore architect, um, you end up with a lot of uh, one point perspective photos. Um, working in, in narrow row houses. So um, as I was assembling this presentation, I, I thought this was, this was clever and wanted to share. So thank you for your time. So I think Philip, uh, you are on and ready to go. Uh, hello. Mm, thank you. I mean, I was uh, supposed to appear before the time, but uh, you finished earlier than expected, so it's quite nice. <laughs> now, and that leaves me with a kind of difficulty of trying to match your speed, which will be not so easy, but let's try. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, well, first of all, to Christina Murphy, who invited me. Uh, to uh, come on Jordan for the being moderator and to Evan Weevil. So hopefully we can have a nice conversation. Um, this is the name of uh, our office. Uh, it's called International Design. And um, it's a joke that nobody understands because it's completely internal. And um, I'll minimize this. Um, it's an immigration office of the Netherlands. So 
both my partner and me are foreigners. So Rotterdam maybe is very business friendly, but well, for foreigners it's not the same. So it's just takes some kind of challenge to try to put an office uh, by Mexican and Turkish. Um, what I want to talk about today is not so much the specific of Rotterdam, but about the specific culture of Rotterdam. And uh, why I came here, one of the reasons was to study at the Berlach Institute, but the other reason was that I admire a lot this office of uh, metropolitan architecture, office of metropolitan architecture led by Rem Kolhas. Later, I ended up working for them, and, uh, and it was uh, a very interesting school for design process. This is a project I was involved uh, for a master plan in Moscow. And when clients will come, they will think that these are different projects, but no, it's the same site. So actually, the process of design was a kind of intense, very intense uh, uh, elaboration of multiple options. Uh, so you will compete against you with your team, but you will also try to impress REM and REM will try to find out what is the best piece. Uh, so this is uh, kind of connected to his uh, own theories of uh, paranoid critical method in which you are trying to, by just sheer amount of quantity, you are trying to uh, uh, bypass the obvious and arrive to something new. So what I just show one project uh, and it's, it's a bit long presentation, I'll do as fast as I can. It's an international competition to do a new antenna tower in Chanakale. This is in Turkey. This project is in collaboration with Powerhouse Company. This is the site. The site uh, has a, uh, several antennas. It's used only for infrastructure um, and, and, and it's quite eroded. The, most of the trees are gone, the vegetation is gone. So the idea of the client is to restore this place as a place for public space, as a place for, for gathering. So not dividing infrastructure from politics or public space. So, this is one of the things that which, which, which really believe is interesting. The context is quite beautiful, of course. And this is the site. The site is quite complicated. It has a kind of island with the, there was a house and they expect us to build a tower here. The brief was asking for a tower of hundred meters height, but also to accommodate their visitor center and restaurant, et cetera, with the shocking views that I just show you. So um, the first thing we did uh, for a long time of the competition was to try to see if we could design an icon. What would be the next icon to do for this plot? Uh, so, uh, so these are just some examples of uh, old or recent attempts to make an iconic tower. Uh, this led us to test several options. Uh, actually, uh, we counted 132, which were modeled in 3D. So the same way as in OMA, we will do it with models. In this case, we did it in 3D. And we will just take the picture from the same location to start to compare. Um, and from you, you will test all kinds of fantasies. Uh, and, and most of them didn't trigger any, any kind of curiosity. They were just funny for 10 seconds and later they were, bore, they were boring or unbuildable. Uh, but slowly that critical mass start to give us some hints of what we didn't want to do. So um, this idea of to make this icon started to become very annoying. And, uh, and, and we thought that actually probably the things can go in a different way if we just think it in a, uh, from a different point of view. So again, this critical method that you do a thousands of options to find unsuspected correspondences as, uh, as Dali will say, it didn't really prove to be successful because no matter how many ideas we were trying, we were just embarrassed by these kind of almost vomit of forms. Uh, and we thought this is not what we want. Um, but it took us a long time and, uh, to arrive here. So just before three weeks of the, before the deadline, we returned to the, see the plot, we returned to see the brief. And there was something which was kind of interesting, which was that the site had an island and we thought, okay, let's, let's look at it again into the topography, what to do here. Uh, there's some context. We will never be able to do a, 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 an iconic tower like as Foster in Barcelona. It's just too small, 100 meters. Uh, but we have the hill, which is interesting. But uh, so the first thing to do is not to do this, uh, not to make an icon like this. Don't put a program here. Uh, the second thing we thought that, well, the, since the views are quite beautiful, it's quite nice to just keep it light from there. 
and try to see if you could not only see the Dardanelles, but see the whole landscape. We look into some other architect, architects and see what they were doing with this. And we thought we should exploit the periphery, the periphery of the plot, which was allowed. And after that, we decided to, to do a critical step, which was to divide the tower from the, from the program. So if, the, if you could have the views from that, from low level to the Dardanelles, you didn't need to put everything on top. So you could have instead some kind of reaches to have a view of the, of the landscape and then have this panoramic perspective from all, to all directions. And at some point we had this loop around the site that was kind of connecting. And then we thought, well, finally the tower could just bind to this whole thing. So um, one more thing that we discovered during the process is that the engineers told us that it was not a good idea to put the antenna close to the visitor center because of the, uh, of the microwave power that this is uh, affecting humans. So we, divide, we started to put it away from the project program, which was against what the brief was saying, and then to anchor it to this uh, panoramic uh, platform. Um, and then we concentrate the visitor center and the restaurant in one program area uh, around the site. So here we have all the components of, of the design. Naturally, we did this diagram after the, the process, but here I will show you the process, how we started. We started first by making the loop in 3D and then slowly start to see what does it mean if we bind it uh, with one program. Um, uh, the tower there was not so efficient because the antennas actually need just a, a square plan. Also with that will change. Slowly we will see that the tower is changed to become much more efficient into this, um, in, in this way. Different tests of how to organize the, the form, um, how to organize the program there. We didn't know, but it was just fine tuning after this and slowly start to uh, finally get some kind of form of how this project could be. And these are the, one of the last steps of the, of the form. And then finally how this uh, uh, shape takes place. Uh, here's where shaping still the, the design. And we are on, also understanding by modeling the, the, the characteristics of the landscape that you can never see the project complete. It's always fragments. Also, we discovered by doing the, 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 the 3D model and the views that we have made a garden in itself, which was also kind of nice. So it's a kind of loop that you arrive to a public program that has a restaurant and a visitor center here. So here are the plants, very simple. The tower is in the entrance, and then you have the uh, viewing deck, and then the, you have the visitor center. And, the, and in the bottom, you will have the infrastructure for the antenna. This is the model. This is the render, how it looks. Panoramic views amazing views. It's all made in curtain, so it also is kind of more compatible with the, how nature takes place. But so as you can see, it's, it's trying to make a kind of dialogue with the, with the contours of the landscape. So it's not anymore the icon that, that, that was the obvious uh, 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 solution in our, uh, when we start the project. And of course, it has a kind of uh, way to experience it fragmented through sequence. And uh, this is a, the visitor center. Um, and this is how the, the program is organized, as I explained before. But then, of course, when we want, after this, we have to actually build it. And so we have to construct, uh, to build, all, make all the drawings and do the calculations. The engineers struggle a lot because the tower could not move. But finally got built uh, just recently. It's not open yet to the public. You can see the final steps here. And these are some of the recent pictures of, uh, of the building with a panoramic platform. And, uh, and well, this is from the entrance, the landing from the tower, so which, uh, and, and you can see here how it looks from the, the different points of view. So just to conclude, uh, um, these are the submissions of the other competitors from Fernando Romero, Ala, Olaf Gibster, Su Fujimoto. They were, most of them tried to place the program inside the tower. So um, that therefore the tower became quite, quite heavy. In, in some of them, or the, or the shapes were not efficient for to make the, the telecommunication. So at the end of the day, uh, um, there were only two projects which were more or less using the periphery of the site and making a simple tower. But the tower of Esnojeta, which looks similar to our project, uh, in, put also the program inside. So the, the tower was much more uh, heavy and expensive than ours. So ours was also the cheapest in that sense. And that's what I have to say today. I hope was on time.
Yeah, thank you, uh, Felix, and, and also uh, Evan. Uh, yeah, as far as time, you're right, right on time. I think we have uh, a lot of time to uh, to actually talk about both um, processes, I guess, of how you're working. And they're very different projects where, um, from what I am telling from what was presented, uh, Evan, you seem to be working within the city. And Felix, you seem to be working outside or without the city as a the city being a part of the, um, I guess, viewing the city from a distance. You're working more, it seems like, with the landscape. So it seems to be Not different. necessarily. No? Uh, we have many projects in the city, but probably the difference from Evan is that he works a lot in the same city or in the same kind of surroundings, while we do a lot of competitions in several cities in different parts of Europe. So therefore, it's, um, it's not a very direct understanding of of uh, of uh, of a season. it's not so intimate. We don't know the contractors. Everything is a, a kind of experiment. Yeah. So I'm just wondering. So in, in your case, uh, Felix, you're it's almost as if you're um, c connecting the city. It seems to me, at least with that project, almost connecting the city to what was being called an icon, uh, in that sense. And then with uh, Evan, it seems like your your connection, at least with the projects that we've been looking at, the connection is with looking at this blighted city and trying to give it a, a relight or a new light in the context of the, um, the citizens that are living within that area. And uh, so I don't know if that's the case. Again, you can you know, qualify how you're explaining it. But a couple of questions that I had, um, now start off with you, Evan. Um, in the context of what you're designing, you're talking about the clientele that you're working with. And now I've spent a lot, quite a bit of time in Detroit and I still do projects in Detroit, which Detroit and Baltimore to me are very um, similar in a lot of ways when it comes to blight within the city and also the social constructions within the city that have made it what made them what they are. And the, uh, the segregated communities, you know, you talked about Harlem Park in particular. And one of the things that I think is curious to me, and you were talking about the um, some of the organizations like grassroots types of organizations that you may be working with, how do you navigate your projects in relation to the, uh, I think you used uh, the, uh, let me see what terms, basically, so basically what I'm trying to do is use terms like up and coming neighborhoods. How does that differ from the gentrification within a neighborhood that begins to be happening both in Detroit, also in Baltimore that I see? And what are the, some of the pluses and minuses that you see uh, looking at either one of those definitions? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think there's a big, I've, I think I've learned over the, you know, over the last few years, um, we end up getting a lot of calls from um, outside, uh, well, let's call them developers, the startup developers, people that are attempting to, they want to kind of get their feet wet in real estate development, and they feel that Baltimore is the place, <laughs> the place to do it. Um, I think I've learned to read those how should I say this? I, I've learned that I, I shouldn't be involved in projects that I wouldn't want to happen in my own neighborhood, um, where some people have different priorities than others. And I think because our work is so, um, we create such intimate relationships with our clients, that's, it's not just sort of a we'll accept all, all comers, right? Um, so you really, really try to get at the core of people's motivations. I like my first sort of interaction with my clients to really understand what they're trying to accomplish whether it's a, you know, a homeowner or whether it's a small business or someone who's attempting to take, you know, a blighted property in a, you know, in a neighborhood that's, you know, sort of seen better days and, and transform it. I think with Baltimore, there's an interesting element. You know, look at a neighborhood like Harlem Park or, um, you know, Sandtown, areas like that, where there is, um, you know, development taking place. At a certain point, just the preservation of these buildings, this historic urban fabric is critical and is important almost independent of what the motivations are because the city, um, regardless of what a, a developer's motivations are, the city will, will only bear what it, it can bear, so to speak. Um, so in a lot of ways, I don't think it's as simple as a blanket statement that any development in Baltimore is good development, right? It's not that simple, but in a lot of these neighborhoods, any investment in these properties that are at risk of, of crumbling down, I think is a positive step. So, um, not sure if that, that answered your question, but we try to tread lightly and try to be respectful. And the, the people we want to work with are the ones that are sensitive to, to the impact they have in their communities. Yeah, no, I think it does respond because it sounds like you know, there's a conscious ethic 
to your process, which I think is, is uh, quite important. And uh, we have a question uh, from the audience, but before I ask that question, um, if you haven't, I want to uh, ask you, Felix, and your process, one of the things that I think is interesting, like looking at both uh, of your work, but the element of process of uh, going through the design development that you spoke of, and sort of stepping, you know, stepping away from that, coming in as a, so this might be a long shot, but you know, I see coming in as a, as a uh, you talked about the sort of foreign context coming into the Netherlands. Was there, you know, you're creating an icon within, you know, another city, another space, uh, coming in from the outside. What, was there any relationship as far as understanding your relationship and your partner's relationship to? designing an icon for is this i think this is a rotterdam project mm, the project is in turkey um i'm sorry turkey the project is in turkey but um uh well um the the first thing that i that i thought about when you were saying that the project actually connects uh, to the city uh it's it is interesting because the city, the, 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 the project is very close to the city, uh, of course. Um, you can see it from the city. Um, and what is what I can see is that uh, the government or the client, what they want to to is to increase the amount of uh, accessible and public spaces in the landscape. So what is used to be just treated as infrastructure as supposedly something which is not political, not design, now could play that role now, how certainly infrastructure could, could open new windows to, to, to hybridize uh, agendas, to say, you can make a garden, you can reforest, you can have an ecological agenda, you could uh, uh, bring people to, to, to the area to experience nature. Uh, uh, so in that sense, it's, it's kind of urban, even though it's not in the middle of the city. So um, that I think it's, uh, uh, it's important now. Regarding the process, I mean, as I tried to explain, our first hunch was that we have to make a powerful icon. But as you could see from the other competitors, all of them did a powerful icon. But, but most of these icons were not connected to the landscape or to the contours or to the, or to the economy uh, uh, of, of the ra rationale of the economy. So in that sense, making an icon by itself, it's is uh, too old fashioned, I would say. Like uh, it needed, and we didn't know that. We started by doing the same designs that the other offices did. And we had a crisis in which was, no, this is not what is needed for here. We need to be, we need to the, arrive to an icon that is respectful to the, to the, to the landscape. We need to make a, an icon that is buildable. And therefore the program, the public program is not in the tower. So the tower is very light. We need to uh, uh, take an effort to restore the forest in the area. So um, making a, almost you could say it's a anti-icon in, in a way. The tower is in, 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 the, in the foreground. It's not even in the, in the client want the tower in the, in the tip of the plot to have the most visibility. We put it in the back. So it has certain degree of, uh, of, uh, of restraint, uh, I would say. Um, Yes, of course, it has a kind of vis visibility and certain kind of iconicity, uh, but it's a kind of, uh, mostly it's about a narrative that you could, with one gesture, you could try to solve the different uh, uh, challenges of the brief, the views of the site, the, the tower itself, the, 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 uh, the, the way it connects to the landscape and to make a garden. So I, I don't know if that can help answer some of, the, of what you were thinking. Yeah, I think so. Um... Just sort of going back and forth between, because one, one question that I do want to ask is trying to find common ground between your processes at, uh, and how that tends to connect. And uh, I'm curious to have a conversation with both of you about that. But before I do that, um, I did want to respond to one of the uh, questions from the audience. And this is for you, uh, Evan. But it says, uh, what are uh, some common, uh, common and or major issues that you encounter when working in uh, abandoned homes within Baltimore? Um, oh, that's a good question. Is um, I guess I can't really respond to the to the questioner, but um, there's definitely some some practical elements. I mean, we are, um, you know, I'm, I'm I'm a bit of a like neighborhood architect in the sense that we you know we do a lot of work in row homes. It was sort of the, that last slide, right? That's kind of our our bread and butter. 
Um, so you learn to kind of, you know, see, um, see some of the more structural, structural or like practical uh, issues that may arise. Um, I mean, in a, in a completely abandoned row house, it's really about preserving that shell, which is sort of what we ended up doing in the Dallas Street project, which is essentially, um, you know, we built a completely freestanding wood, wood frame structure within the sort of brick, three walls of the brick row house, which is about kind of preserving that urban fabric, but it, at a certain point, it's not really doing much. Um, I guess, it, you know, it still serves as a mass wall and it's still, you know, still, you know, there's a little bit of water infiltration protection there too, but um, part of what I like about exploring these abandoned houses is, is sort of the adventure of it. I feel like there's not a lot of adventure left um, in, archite in architecture. So um, there's actually a slide I didn't include, which is me in a, in a gas mask because the house was covered in black mold. And that's something to me, which is <laughs> exciting. Um, but really it's about, I think a lot of our work in the city deals with um, really these sort of explorations on the front end and determining what elements are worth preserving and what is not worth preserving. So I, I wouldn't consider myself a, a preservationist by any sense, but I think that there's interesting elements and things that are worth preserving because of craftsmanship and history and context. And then we attempt to sort of make what's new, new and, and function um, you know, not only aesthetically, but um, you know, practically um, be contemporary and new. But um, really just going into old row houses is just making sure that the floor uh, doesn't give way <laughs> underneath you um, is, sort of, is sort of step one. And then step two is um, just, you know, making sure it can hold back up. And row houses are really kind of a, an amazing housing typology, um, just really true, true modular housing, um, shared bearing walls, you know, shared, um, you know, even like the, you know, thermal, um, um, you know, passivity through walls and things like that. So it's really kind of an amazing, uh, fascinating housing typology that I'm, you know, even after doing, you know, hundreds of them at this point, I'm still excited every time I go into one, which is one of the things I love about the work we do. Oh, great. That actually, that question was from uh, Ellen Martinez, just so, uh, you know, if you have any uh, context okay. about for that person that was asking the question. Well, so one of the things that I, that I have as far as, this is a question for both of you, I'm trying to look at uh, parallels between what your projects are doing, at least the ones that have been presented today, um, or even maybe some of the, uh, your own philosophy in your, in your work. But, uh, you know, but you just use the word sharing. Um, and, the, you know, in the uh, Baltimore, the townhomes, the row homes, you have sort of shared walls, and it actually creates the, um, the, the canvas for the city in much of a way. And then if I look at the, the, your projects, uh, Felix, that you're presenting, you're creating this sort of a, uh, this icon. They say for the for the city, which actually is this tie, so it's a it's a shared image, a shared project in relationship to at least a visual connection, and then the programs that you proposed uh, within that space. And I'm just wondering, you know, they're, they're two different approaches, two different designs uh, in particular. But do you see between your presentations and or which you might know about each other's uh, process that might might have in common, and the sense that you're the way this you approach uh, your designs or your uh, no, definitely. I think uh, uh, I I don't necessarily think that the 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 being urban or not uh, makes a difference uh, in this case. But there's uh, some kind of things which we also use uh, in, in in the method to do more with less. For example, that Evan discussed. Uh, he's also talking about retrofitting uh, a kind of existing layer, which we are also doing. We are reconfiguring what used to be an infrastructure which was which had zero social purpose um so um, it's always is never a tabula rasa we always are kind of dealing with a kind of uh, um, background information which helps give uh, uh, input to the design agenda and, and 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 finally i mean some of the projects that that Evan showed uh, take into account the context as well and they're also very they are careful in reading uh, not only the forms of the neighbor buildings, but uh, probably the, 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 what are the current uh, building methods that are like feasible. And we also take, the, ta take that into account. So when we were doing the, the design of the tower, we changed the, the, the structure into a kind of a solid steel, like a, uh, like a tube, because uh, it, it was the most uh, uh, feasible way of, of building it. So, um, so yeah, I think there there are some 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 things uh, which are which are common. But as I mentioned, being a Turkish and a Mexican in the Netherlands, 
is not we don't have this access to developers, uh, etc. Uh, we need to find work through competition mostly uh, in in different parts of the world. So it's a uh, um, uh, it's it's also um, um, less intimate, but uh, but you could also have an kind of overview of of what are the current challenges in different parts of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's, there's a definitely an interesting context, and it sort of inspired me that maybe we should enter more competitions. <laughs> but uh, you know, we're we're dealing with, as I mentioned, we're dealing with with small budgets, small spaces. Um, you know, um, and really, I, I love what what Felix said about just the sort of there is no tabula rasa. It's all, there's context, right? Every project, every architectural project has context, and is made richer because of with a deeper understanding of that context. So. We're challenged with, especially with, with East Wing, with the work, we have a lot of clients, a lot of clients doing what are essentially small projects. So we have the, the sort of this constant um, getting to know clients and this, this intimate sort of empathetic relationship that I strive to create, which um, as, as I met, mentioned, my best projects lead to, to friends and I don't, you know, <laughs> uh, people that we have lasting relationships with. So, um, but you know, I, I've learned, and I, I think, as Felix mentioned, with his tower, which is obviously a very different scale, that there's a there is sort of a pragmatism needed. He ended up creating a beautiful, you know, the sort of most compelling form that was also, you know, an economically viable form too. So we, you know, we exist in in reality where, you know, in a row house project, our sort of mantra is like we've got one big move, like we can't afford two big moves. You know, we've got one sort of chance to do something architecturally interesting because the real challenge, the real project is creating shelter or re rehabilitating a, a building. And, you know, 80% or 90% of the, of the budget is likely going to that. So um, our goal is just to, you know, we, we try to have fun and want to do interesting things and um, leave clients with interesting spaces. But really that's, that's where we are is like, what can we do in an affordable way that creates valuable space um, and still serves our clients? Okay, and uh, also uh, Alex, uh, Alex. There's a question from uh, Ellen Martinez that she's inquiring about the, um, <clears throat> as far as the, the icon for the city, is the community included at any point in uh, your design process? And if so, uh, to what extent? Um, this is uh, uh, not the case. I mean, uh, this is a provincial government that, uh, that wants to put in an agenda of how to use uh, the, this this land, which is only used for, for uh, infrastructure. Uh, so there were not any uh, interaction with the, with the community. Well, first of all, there, there's no people living here uh, in the area. Uh, we do hope two things can happen, is that the, the visitor center um, has, uh, we, we propose this to the client that the that it should be hosted by a by an institution that has an interest in preserving the forest, so therefore giving it a kind of social agenda, and they were very receptive to this idea, uh, because in a way the brief they knew they wanted to do a visitor center, but we told them that they also need to think what could be the, the environmental or social agenda of this of this institution, and so we think that that could be the connection point of uh, of, of the community, but that only is a proposal. Because at the moment there is there is no people in the area. I don't know if that answers a little bit. Yeah, I think so. And also, um, I, part of my curiosity, I've been to um, Turkey a few times, and I know the um, politics can be quite interesting there. When you, you said it was uh, proposed by provincial government. Yeah. In the context: Were there any? Um, I guess were there any implications or any uh, yeah any implications to the political agenda? that was set forth versus uh, your own proposals? Well, um, certainly the government wants to make an icon to be to show it to people that, oh, we have this uh, telecommunication tower, we are modernizing Turkey, you know, like, uh, um, and, and I think that uh, we were uh, lucky enough to bypass that initial agenda. We think that we didn't only make an icon, but we really tried to make uh, public space, uh, kind of attractive place to gather, to, to go to a garden, to look at the city. So I don't think our project is only to take a picture from far away and say, okay, nice icon. We really try to engage with the landscape. And I think that, that um, the agenda of the government in that sense has been uh, uh, enriched by, by the proposal, I hope. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I can actually extend that question to, to you, Evan, as far as the politics within Baltimore. I mean, politics and Baltimore and uh, social agendas go sort of hand in hand. Uh, do you brush up against any um, political agendas that maybe stifle uh, some of your process or progress? Um, I don't know about sort of, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call them political agendas. I mean, we're, we're obviously dealing with a lot of, um, you know, owner, owner finance, finance stuff. I would love to get into more sort of community-based or public architecture. We're just not, not quite there yet. Um, so if you have any, any connections, let me know. But, um, uh, you know, recently we had an experience where, which actually made me sort of pause and, and reconsider um, the kind of work we do, which was I, I attended a community hearing um, for a project that was um, attempting to be built in a, um, in the Holland's Market neighborhood, actually. Um, and the community, um, I, I, I admittedly sort of didn't, I suppose, didn't put enough thought into it, but I presented the, the project, which was a, you know, a row house renovation, but it was an attempt to create a multifamily project. And there was, you know, very passionate <laughs> uh, opposition from the community. Um, and they were, they were fairly kind to me. I was sort of the messenger at that point, you know, sort of representing my client, but that was a really sort of pivotal moment in my career to, again, to sort of really be considered about the kind of projects we take and, and think about the greater context that, um, which, you know, is, is sort of a driver doing work within a city is that multiple people are affected. Even a single family residence affects people on the street. You know, it affects, um, you know, it affects the public, you know, businesses, how are they accessible? Um, do they contribute to the streetscape in a meaningful way? Do they contribute to the neighborhood in a meaningful way? Um, it was really a moment for me to, to reflect on um, really being deliberate about the kind of work we want to do and the kind of people we want to work with, which I think is a, a core element of, of my practice, is really about people, um, which, you know, maybe may seem pretty obvious, but I really do, um, you know, love creating things with and for people. So um, I would say that's that's a sort of recent example of you know a you know community engagement that you know did not go well and it actually um, the client was receptive to it and changed um, their sort of approach to what the project would be. So um, in that way, I think it was you know the, the community had their voice and their voice was heard and it, it had an impact and I, I feel good about um, being able to sort of enable that process. I sort of see both of the directions that you guys are taking that. Um... The, you know, the communal voice seems to be heard in each, um, at least in each of your processes, at least there's a real sensitivity to understanding the public reaction and response to uh, what you're creating, whether it's private or at a, uh, at a uh, larger scale, sort of macro and the micro scales. Uh, just, so I guess, so one of the other things that I actually have a question to for, uh, for Felix, is in relationship to, this is more personal uh, potentially, but you mentioned um, your sort of connection to, you know, IND, and coming into uh, the Netherlands to work as you know outsiders coming in, uh, can you speak a little bit more to your experience, um, so we can sort of have an understanding of your um, of your practice, I guess, within uh, the Netherlands. Yeah, I think uh, I mean the Netherlands is a very business friendly uh, country, so it takes you five minutes to register your company uh, or whatever, like ten minutes, nothing. Um, probably in Mexico and other countries will take uh, months and, uh, and probably you have to bribe people. Uh, so in that sense, it's, it's, it's very convenient. Um, saying that, after saying that, I, I have to say that uh, the opportunities that young offices have are very difficult. Are, it's, it's a very kind of closed system in itself. And I'm not even talking about foreigners. I'm just talking in general, young offices, even of Dutch friends that I have, they struggle to find new work. It's complicated because most of the current dynamics are municipalities in collaboration uh, with developers. They find a list of suitable architects with experience to do most of the projects. So the, 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 the space left for like uh, unknown young offices is microscopic. Now, if you add on top of that layer, the, the, the foreign background, that becomes even more complicated. So, so we have not found uh, 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 a way to enter, let's say, the, the classic uh, uh, Dutch market. The, um, the municipality of Rotterdam has given us some assignments to us, um, mostly because uh, uh, architects that used to work for OMA end up working for the municipality. So through some social connections, we have managed to, to do some studies, but it has not been the rule. Um, 
So, um, so we rely a lot on competitions and, and the system of competitions in the Netherlands is very, very, as I say, very close. It's basically restricted competitions between led by developers, uh, project-based and with, a, with, a, with the most important thing being the price of the, of the project and municipalities. And so it's not so open uh, as a kind of uh, as a system. Uh, we recently won a competition, very small competitions in Dordrecht. So there are, there is here and there some small opportunities, but most of most of the young offices, including Dutch friends, they have to find competitions abroad and uh, uh, or yeah, or clients abroad. It's it's um, it's yeah, it's complicated that that part. Um, nevertheless, the, the the Netherlands in general, at least to me, I, I have been very much uh, lucky to be involved in, uh, and that was one of the questions you also raised in the beginning, in teaching. So um, I have been teaching in TU Delft uh, and also have been teaching in, in both universities of Amsterdam and, and Rotterdam um, and, and in several places. So that, that door has been completely open for us. Also the, the door for making research is completely open for us. Uh, we get grants to make research on, for example, we are doing a documentary on, on farming practices currently that maybe I should talk to Evan later. <laughs> um, and, and so this is part is open, but commissions uh, from developers is almost unthinkable for a foreign office. I think it's, it's, very, it's very unlikely. And I don't know if there is a way to change that. Uh, I don't see any Dutch architect protesting uh, they feel that okay this is it uh, <laughs> and it's not the same all over europe our countries are much more open germany uh, uh, even italy uh, uh, czech republic uh, france netherlands is pretty much uh, pretty much established on the system and and it privileges the established famous offices and it also privileges big companies and developers so yeah it's a um, I'm not saying this is a rule for every municipality, but it's yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty rough. <laughs> Hopefully, I didn't give a so negative point of view. No, but, that might segue into uh, there's a question, another question from um, one of the audience members, and this is actually I think for both of you, but um, it's a sort of a general question, but just asking, uh, you know, when coming into this profession, do you feel like you, uh, I, I think, have felt some sense of success as an architect? And it's, like I said, it's a broad question, but I think that's uh, this one. I think that's what was being asked from uh, Mark. And either one of you can respond. Um, this is very interesting. The question: <laughs> When was the yeah. moment that you felt like an architect? Um, I mean, I I used to work in Mexico City for Calach, uh, Alberto Calach, which is a very famous architect in Mexico nowadays. Um, and, and we designed a house all in concrete. I supervised everything. I did all the drawings. I did everything. But for me, I kind of didn't, it didn't um, uh, satisfy my curiosity, my philosophical curiosity. I think an architect, uh, for in my case, at least personally, is the person that is able to understand the articulation of the several forces, politics, philosophy, economy, construction. Uh, yes, poetics of uh, materials and space, but with Kalach, it was mostly only construction and poetics. And, and there was no public agenda. And I think the European education, at least in my case, has opened my eyes to see that the, the, the places where we interact as architects are contested grounds. They are political spaces where you could actually make a difference and where you could actually make a saying. And I mean, the, the project of Chanakale for us, I know it sounds like it's just iconic, but it's, I'm trying to explain again and again that for us, it's not only that, is we are really trying to say, look, you can do iconic architecture and still be respectful to the landscape and allowing people to gather, et cetera. So, I think for me, the Chanakale project is, it was a very unique and special moment where definitely I felt like an architect in all senses. And uh, Evan, what about you? Yeah, it's a, that's an interesting question. I think um, 
where I am in my career and sort of my background, which, um, you know, I, I have sort of an interesting upbringing that I don't, didn't have many, I didn't work for many other architects or, or with other firms. I sort of started my firm as, as soon as possible, which was after sort of my twenties, which were spent mostly, you know, touring and, uh, and playing music. So um, I, I feel like in a lot of ways, I'm sort of inventing this as I go, but I think I have a, there's a really exciting element to what I do where I'm constantly hitting uh, sort of greater levels of um, being an architect, right? So I think I have this sort of classic trajectory of you just scrounge together whatever you can, which is, you know, bathrooms and kitchens, and then that evolves into renovations and additions, and then that evolves into new homes, and then, you know, commercial interiors turns to commercial new construction, right? So you're constantly sort of stacking and growing and challenging yourself. So I think for me, um, I, I have the privilege of um, constantly meeting these new, you know, chasing and then uh, ideally elevating to, to new sort of appreciations for, for what it is to, to be an architect, um, which is very exciting for me. There's also a lot of challenges in that too, right? I'm, I'm constantly, as you sort of grow and, and evolve and, and take on larger and larger projects and more complex projects, um, there's, there's defeats along the way as well, which is again, part of, part of what I love about, um, architecture, the complexity, um, grows and your knowledge and understanding and sensitivity grows with it. So I think to answer the question, um, I don't know if I could pinpoint one moment because I think it's a sort of constantly a constant evolution. Um, but anytime I can, you know, walk into a, a nearly completed space and the client, um, you know, has an appreciate, you know, is starting to feel it and understand and, and the, you know, what was once on paper is now becoming tangible space is always really a highlight moment for me. So yes, I think that's uh, maybe a segue into to closing out uh, today's conversation. I was gonna say, it just as part of my own statement. <laughs> and when I was in school, I used to always say, architecture is a, you know, you don't feel like an architect because it's an old man's uh, field. And, you know, it's, not now, you know, it's, it's not, and it probably never ever was. It's a field for others and everyone, uh, no matter what your gender, no matter what your race, um, as you move forward. Uh, but I think it's interesting to understand the in the context of being an international, coming into it as a foreigner, but then also working in a city, which has uh, domestic issues um, of, of race and other issues that you're trying to deal with as clients. But um, anyway, uh, Christina, I'll leave it to you to sort of close this out, but I wanna thank uh, Felix and uh, Evan for participating. And yep, I'll leave it to you, Christina. Thank you very thank much, you Evan. Yeah, thank you so much, Evan, Felix, Coleman. Amazing, thank you so much on behalf of myself, obviously, Baltimore Sister City Committees, our partners, AIA Baltimore and the Rotterdam Sea Academy from Balkans. I would like really to extend the thank you and from the audience, naturally. Um, I would like to make a few comments before we close. How interesting it was to just listen to different skills, different personality, one of which I know pretty well. And the fact that, uh, and maybe some connections to you made could be in order. The one that uh, the process, the frenzy, the paranoid process being revisited by, by uh, IND and Felix, it's really interesting. And how maybe, and perhaps just to throw an arrow to Rotterdam, how the locale could also provide that one challenge that is necessary to compete at the international level like Felix is doing. On the other side, I, I enjoy the practical and important role of the architect in a city that I started to, um, you know, that I live, currently live, and I started to love, and it's so beautiful. And the contact and the practical approach with people, something that I do and I really try to teach to my students and to myself, reminding, reminding myself every time I practice architecture. So thank you very much for being with us. And I would like to remind the audience that uh, you, you can revisit this lecture um, through the YouTube channel of Baltimore Rotterdam Sister City Committee. And by following us in the social media, you will see when we post this video. There are gonna be, of course, other announcements next Tuesday. Uh, we're gonna come again here at uh, 12 p.m., 6 p.m., depending which side of the world you are in. And I will really enjoy if you can help me welcoming Pavlina Ilieva from PIKL Studio and David David Ter Arvest from the Hocus Hall uh, Rotterdam, mediated by Thais van Spandung from the Baltimore uh, from the Rotterdamse Academy van Balkunst. 
and that is next week, the 1st of March at the same time. So keep an eye to our social media, to of course, IND and East Wing social media for their update and our update. And I really look forward to next Tuesday. Thank you very much again, Coleman, Felix and Evan for being with us. Bye. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Coleman. you very much. All right, nice to meet everyone. Evan. <laughs> nice meeting you. <laughs> okay. We didn't speak about music, but next time. Next yeah. time, yeah. <laughs> okay. All so right. Nice.